Hi there. This is Andy Munn. I'm the pastor of Walnut Hill Presbyterian Church here in Bristol, Tennessee. Today's service that you will participate in was recorded a week ago, so some of the references could be a week late, and that's okay. Uh, we've decided to not do live stream simply because we, we don't have anyone at this point who will run point on that. And uh, also it takes some uh, a little bit of technology to be able to do that. And uh, so we've decided to do this approach as you've, as you've seen over the past few months because it's easier for us to manage and upload. Um, I do want to uh, welcome you, and I'm so glad that you're here to join us for whatever reason. Many of you have health concerns to, uh, to consider, and, uh, and we, we do appreciate that, and we're glad that we're able to do this for you. As far as announcements this week, um, we, uh, we are planning to have a devotional and prayer time on Tuesday at 7 p.m., via Zoom. We also are planning to do a women's Bible study on Wednesday. If you have any tithes or financial gifts that you would like to send, you can do so at the address listed on your screen. And as far as prayers for the people, please pray for my Uncle Bud as he had his right leg amputated this past week due to complications from diabetes. Um, also, I, I appreciate your prayers as I'm dealing with a sinus infection and uh, going to be seeing a doctor about possible procedure to help alleviate some of that because I've been having some issues lately. Uh, we want to continue to pray for Ed Crook as he is recovering from back surgery and also for Delola Larkin as she's been dealing with some issues with vertigo. We also would pray for Arlene Sebastian as she's been having some complications due to some medication, they believe that she has a, a painful rash and um, she thinks that it could be a result of uh, maybe a side effect from medication. Pray for Mildred Whitmer as well. As you know, she had a hip replacement a couple of years ago and has really had a difficult time. She, saw, she has seen a, a new specialist and so uh, that specialist seems to have a better understanding of what's going on and uh, hopefully uh, things will improve for her. Uh, Linda Sirota, which is a friend of Linda Grotsky's, her, her neighbor, um, has a torn rotator cuff that will require surgery, and that is a, um, a challenging recovery, and so we just we, we uh, want you to pray for her. And we also want to pray for Alan Haga, that, uh, which is Terry Leonard's uncle, um, also related to Pete and Jewel Haga. Um, he, uh, he has pneumonia and uh, some other issues with an infection, and uh, just pray for his healing and for his comfort. Uh, let me pray for us now. Father, we thank you that you have brought us here to worship you. And we do pray for all of these requests that you've brought to our attention. We pray for healing. Uh, we pray for, for you to do your work and bring comfort to those who need it. Uh, Father, we thank you that you can... Uh, that you hear us based on what Jesus has done for us, that you care, that you call us to come to you and bring all requests to you. And so we lift up all of these dear ones that were mentioned and we ask that you would do your work in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this week in the sermon, you're going to, to be challenged in God's word, I hope, but in Ecclesiastes chapter six, dealing with what it means to orient our hearts toward wealth. And as we uh, move forward in the worship service, I pray that the Lord would prepare your heart for what he has for you this day. May he bless you today and this week. Call to worship this morning is found in Psalms 95, one through three. Oh, come. Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Thank you. 
Father God, that we would have a thousand tongues to be able to sing your praise. That we would be able to, with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, to praise you for who you are, your majesty, your greatness. That we would be able to, to praise you for your love and grace toward us. Those who rebelled against your holy name in sin, that you sent your son to die for so that we could be reconciled to you by faith in him. We praise you, Father. And we praise you, Jesus, God the Son, for offering yourself in our place as the perfect substitute and the perfect sacrifice. And you offer your perfect righteousness to us to be received by faith in you alone, not by works that we've done, not by our own goodness, not by our church attendance, not by our tithing, not by our anything except for your mercy and grace on the cross given to us freely by faith in you. And God, the Holy Spirit, we praise you, the one who is ever at work in us, making us more and more like Jesus. We pray that you would continue to shape us and that you would fight our resistance And we thank you that you do. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we ask that you would meet us in this place and work in us what is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We have the opportunity to confess our sin together. Uh, and, And some may wonder, in fact, I grew up in a tradition where you just didn't do this. We didn't confess our sin together because it... I'm not sure why. Maybe it was because um, we just thought that, you know, it was kind of a downer. I really don't know. I don't know why we didn't do it. But here's the thing. As believers, we still struggle with sin. And as believers, we have a confident assurance that when we confess our sin, Jesus forgives us. And so when we enter into a time of confession of sin, we can confess boldly that we have sinned against God knowing that Jesus is the one who has cleansed us from this sin. So let's take this time to confess these words together that are printed in the bulletin or on the screen, the same wording, I hope. (laughs) Um, And then we'll have a time of silent confession. Let's pray together. Oh, my Savior, help me. I am slow to learn, prone to forget, and weak to climb. I am in the foothills when I should be on the heights. I am pained by my graceless heart, my prayerless days, my poverty of love, my sloth in the heavenly race, my sullied conscience, my wasted hours, my unspent opportunities. I am blind while the light shines around. Take the scales from my eyes, Grind to dust my heart of unbelief. Make it my highest joy to study you, meditate on you, gaze on you, sit like Mary at your feet, lean like John on your breast, appeal like Peter to your love, count like Paul all things but done. I believe, help my unbelief. Amen. Let's take a moment to silently confess any specific sins that the Lord brings to mind. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. This is a verse that's telling us what the Savior would do. This is a verse that is is letting us know. This is exactly how 
the same God's people would cover our sins, would heal us from the wound that is deepest, and that is our separation from Him because of our sin. And the good news of the gospel is this, friends. This is why we know we are forgiven even now. So I'm going to ask the praise team to come forward, and I would ask you to stand as we sing the song, Let Us Love and Sing and Wonder. We're going to sing it just a little differently. The tune is the same, but just a little differently in terms of, uh, of the rhythm. So uh, you'll, you'll catch on. It'll be fine. Let us love and sing and wonder, let us praise the Savior's name. He has hushed the Lord's loud thunder, He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame, He has washed us with His blood, He has washed us with His blood, He has washed us with His blood. He has brought us nigh to God. Let us love the Lord who bought us, pitied us when enemies. God us by His grace and taught us, gave us ears and gave us eyes. He has washed us with His blood. He has washed us with His blood. He has washed us with His blood. He presents our souls to God. Let us sing through fierce temptation Threatens hard to bear us down. For the Lord our strong salvation holds in view the conqueror's crown. He who washed us with his blood. He who washed us with his blood. He who washed us with his blood. Soon will bring us home to God. wonder, grace, and justice, joys and point to mercy store. When through grace in Christ our trust is, justice smiles and asks no more. He who washed us with his blood, he who washed us with his blood, he who washed us with his blood, has secured our to God. Let us praise and join the chorus of the saints enthroned on high. Who they trusted Him before us, now their praises fill the sky. Thou hast washed us with Thy blood. Thou hast washed us with thy blood. Thou hast washed us with thy blood. Thou art worthy, Lamb of God. You may be seated. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we have access to the Father, and we come to him not as strangers, but as children. And so, because of the merits of Jesus, let's boldly go to the throne together. Father, we come to you as your children, praising your name, thanking you for your goodness to us. Father, we are a people who are weak. We are a people who are blind to certain things. 
And yet in some areas we're strong, and in some areas our eyes are open. We are finite. And so often we we don't understand that. There is so much going on in our world, in our nation, in our communities. And I think most of us are very quick to, to jump on the others that we might disagree with instead of listening first and having good conversation that would lead to a deeper unity, a deeper love, deeper change. Help us in that, Lord. Help us to to truly listen to others and see them as fellow image bearers of God first and deal with the differences with love. Lord, I pray that Your church would be the place where our nation would look to find better ways of relating one to another. Father, I pray that the church would be a place where the nation would look to see how to deal with the various things that our hearts are, are so easily distracted by. Power, money, sex, whatever it is. That we would sacrifice all of those things to you. That we would give them up and use whatever you give us to your glory according to your designs, according to your plans, according to your leading. Whether it's positions of authority or the right use of the sexuality you've given us or the right use of the wealth that you may have blessed us with, or whatever else it is, Lord. We so quickly try to find our value, our worth, and our significance in things other than you. Lord, as your people, continually challenge that by your Spirit in our hearts. Convict us where we need it. Convict us where we're fighting you about the conviction and continually shape us to be more and more like your Son. Father, I pray that in that you would grow our love for our neighbor and for one another. It seems that everyone is angry these days. I pray that you would use us to be your ambassadors, ambassadors of your peace, that we would strive to fight the battles that you would have us fight and mostly to fight them with the love that you've given us. Not only have you given us everything we need by your Spirit, Jesus, you even gave us words to pray that we pray now. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite you to turn in your copy of the scriptures now to Ecclesiastes. We're getting back on track with Ecclesiastes. Our series here recently, um, since we've been in the pandemic, has been uh, what it means to orient our hearts. And the book of Ecclesiastes does direct us that way. It's Solomon's word to uh, his son, uh, presumably to his children as well, and certainly the Lord's word through Solomon to us about, frankly, where we tend to orient our hearts and where God would have us rightly orient our hearts. And we've looked at different things. What does it mean to orient our hearts in life, in time, uh, with our neighbor, with one another? And today, we're looking at what it means to orient our hearts toward wealth. 
Um, What I would like to do is just read one part of the passage, and we're going to look at the larger passages. I want to look at at, uh, chapter 5, verse 18. So, uh, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Father, we come to you now and we ask that you would make this your holy word sweeter than the drippings of a honeycomb. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I shared this story a few years ago in a different sermon. I guess it would have been about close to 30 years ago now. Casey and I were talking about getting married and talked to her mom and stepdad about it. And so he took me out to eat to Subway on Cedar Bluff in Knoxville. And we sat down, and I was a little nervous because he could be a little gruff, and uh, and he enjoyed that, having a little bravado and uh, being a little antagonistic. And he looked at me. He leaned across the table. By the way, he looked like Papa Smurf. That was the joke. So Papa Smurf, angry Papa Smurf, looking at me and said, so what are you worth? I reached in my pocket and (laughs) I said, well, looks like about 27 cents. That was not the right answer. (laughs) I'm not going to tell you what he said to me after that. And while I hated the question, as I've grown older, I'm probably like what he was asking. I look at the lives, the cars, the homes of other people, and I want more. I get on Facebook, and it's like this endless heartache. Look at their lives. Look how how successful they are. Look what they're doing. They're more financially secure and seem happier than me. Why am I sharing this with you? Because I know talking to people... Many of you do that too. I'm not alone. This is not a poor Andy moment, by the way. It's an Andy's just like you moment. And you're just like me. We want more. We tend to think that being happy means that we're more financially secure. I wonder, I've mentioned this before in sermons, I wonder if we would go back and visit our 20-year-old self, and I know that there are many in the room that are younger than 20, okay? But if we could visit our 20-year-old self and we could say, look, this is what my life is like right now. I wonder if our 20-year-old selves would say, wow, you've exceeded what I thought I would do. But is it enough? Most of us have not learned the secret of contentment that Paul talks about in Philippians. That in plenty or in want, not having anything, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what that verse means. It's not an athletic slogan. It seems like once we've arrived to where our goals take us, we make new goals. Because we always want more. More, more, more. We're never satisfied. And this is exactly the plight of our hearts that this passage is addressing. Jeff Myers in his book on Ecclesiastes writes, This passage is one we Americans need to hear. The problem in the country right now is expectations are so heightened that we come to expect more than we can ever hope to acquire. Thus, we constantly live unsatisfied lives. I think he's right. And what this larger passage is telling us 
is that our only hope in having a godly heart orientation toward wealth is for God to do a work in our hearts. That's the only way we can have the right orientation toward wealth. It's for God to work His power in our hearts to shape us. And there's two main ideas we see come out of this passage. One is the weakness of wealth, and the other is the power of God. The weakness of wealth and the power of God. So let's first talk about the weakness of wealth. The weakness of wealth, um, in large measure, deals with the false sense of power that wealth can give us. And the passage talks about that, and we'll see that in a moment. But, But we know that that's true, because in our nation, we're kind of fixated on wealth, whether we realize it or not. In fact, I would guess that right now, if I'd ask you the question, are you wealthy, most of us would say no. No, in fact, let me tell you how I'm not wealthy. And then we start talking about different things, financial things, and we find out uh, that in certain contexts, our problems are, as we jokingly say sometimes, first world problems. I was at a restaurant the other day with uh, a friend, and, uh, and they, this restaurant uses paper straws. Have you ever used the paper straws? Oh my goodness, you think masks are bad? I mean, it's like pixie sticks with really, th- really thick pixie sticks. And so when you're like, drink- it's just a texture thing. We both were like, oh, and we were complaining about the straws. And I said, wait, we're complaining about straws while we're drinking clean, purified iced water. Oh, first world problems. The first thing that we see about wealth in the passage, this is back at chapter 5, verse 8, is that An improper focus on wealth creates social problems. This is the first weakness we see of wealth. An improper focus on wealth creates social problems. Verse 8, if you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. For the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields." Now, now we read these kinds of things, and frankly, if you look at them, you go, okay, what in the world is he saying here? I think I get it, but then what's that last verse about? The last verse is basically saying there, there's going to be wealth in the land, and, and it's good for a king to cultivate fields because it creates more jobs, right? That's kind of the idea. It's kind of a practical application. But the heart of the passage is basically saying this. There's two things, but one is someone else always has more. That, that word for higher official, I don't know why they translate it higher official. It's just the word tall, haughty, proud. It's not really a term that's used for an official. I can under, Hebrew is a nuanced language, okay? Um, Greek is like English. You know, you can pretty much park a helicopter on a dime with Greek. Hebrew is much more nuanced. And so you kind of figure out the context in that. So it might mean a high official, but the point is this. Someone else always has more. It doesn't matter where you are in life. Someone else always has more. And you know it's true because wherever you are in life in terms of wealth, you're going to look and say, wow, I wish I had that. But do we ever look the other way? We always have more than someone else. I think it's fascinating because... I've had conversations with people uh, that are much, much wealthier than we are. And inevitably, it seems like at some point in the conversation, if the conversation's long enough, I'm going to hear a complaint about how they just don't have that much. And I'm going, what? Do you worry about where your money's coming from? But what I never think about is when I complain about money in front of someone else who has less, guess what they're thinking? You're complaining? The point is, you know, someone else has more, but but it's not just that. It's that this obsession with wealth brings a, a kind of false sense of power that gets corrupted. Because how does the passage starts off? It, it starts off about oppression of the poor and violation of justice and righteousness. And it's something that's very real. In fact, what Solomon is saying is when he says, don't be uh, amazed at the matter, 
He's literally saying, don't be shocked. This is what happens. But what he's not saying is, it's okay. He's saying that when there is an improper focus on wealth, there's social problems that happen. Injustice happens, corruption happens, oppression happens. Don't be surprised. This is what happens when our focus is in the wrong place. When our focus is on the the accumulation for wealth for its own sake, arrogance grows. We begin to have a sense of worth in the wealth that we have. And so we ask questions like, what are you worth? And we begin to ask ourselves questions, what am I worth? And we begin to attach our worth with a dollar symbol or with property or with job status or where I am on the corporate ladder. And this arrogance causes us to look at people with less as if they are less. I know it doesn't answer all the problems that are going on in our country right now in terms of of race and things like that. But I do wonder how much socioeconomic disparity drives a lot of the oppression. That's what this verse is talking about. I'm not saying race doesn't play a, a factor into it. And I'm not trying to answer all these questions in this sermon. That's not what this passage is about. But this problem is as old as sin. An improper focus on wealth creates social problems. The second thing we see about the weakness of wealth is that the appetite for wealth is never satisfied. Verse 10, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There's a a lot here, and I'm not trying to hit every point. But but one of the main points is that that this, um, this focus on wealth creates an insatiable appetite for more. We're never satisfied. And yet wealth is like the vapor that Solomon describes. It's something that that doesn't have true meat to it. It's something that you can kind of see through. It doesn't have true worth on its own standing. And the pursuit of it is something that will never satisfy. As, as one author writes, it's, it's like drinking salt water. You're really thirsty. You drink salt water, and guess what? <laughs> it's not going to quench your, your thirst. Not only is it going to make you more thirsty, it's going to make you sick. The picture that we have here is that there's an insatiable desire for more, and there's never enough. Nothing will satisfy. We can't acquire enough. And instead of bringing fulfillment, bringing rest, the passage, this part of the passage ends with the person pursuing wealth not being able to sleep because of the troubles that it brings. And even talks about how we can watch others consume the things that we work hard to build. So there's this, there's this never satisfied sense when we're focused on wealth. That's another weakness of wealth. A third weakness we see is that the accumulation of wealth can leave us empty. There is a grievous evil, verse 13, that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go, and what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days 
He eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. This passage mentions two grievous evils. And it's talking about the accumulation of wealth. And the first picture we have that's a grievous evil is hoarding. I know some of you have watched those shows, Hoarders, you know, where there's all this stuff piled up and we wonder what's going on here. And so we have to ask, what is the root of hoarding? The sense that we get from the passage is it's the amassing of wealth for wealth's own sake so that we have a sense of value and worth from all the things that we have. And the problem is that we can amass all of this wealth and in a moment it can be taken away. If you've ever watched the the series Downton Abbey, I only got through about three seasons. Then I found out that one of my favorite guys was going to die and not be on the show. So I'm like, "Eh, you know what? This is just a soap opera. I'm done. But part of the the big deal and the the premise of the show is, and now I just ruined it for some, but he's been gone for like 10 years. So it's not a spoiler, okay? Um, If I found it on the internet, you can too. But the point is, you know, the the premise of Downton Abbey within the first couple episodes is that the main guy, is it Crowley? Is that his name? I can't remember the main family's name. But anyway, he loses everything because he invested everything in the railroads in the U.S. and it went belly up. It's a picture here. We can invest in so much, hoard in so much, and it can be gone like that. And, And what the point is, We can focus our attention, our sense of worth, our identity, our value in our wealth. And we can hoard it up. And not only is hoarding up showing us that we are attributing worth and value, our worth and value to this stuff. But the grievous evil number two is we can spend our whole lives hoarding. But do you know that when you die, you don't take it with you? Just like it says in Job. Naked I came into the world, naked I shall return. Casey's stepdad used to joke that in his funeral, he wanted somebody to rent a Brinks truck and follow the hearse. Why? It was a joke, right? He was, you know, because you know, I mean, here's the, you know, you can't take it with you. And even in this passage, it says, and and if you lose it all, you don't have anything to give those after you. Here's the thing. Wealth is temporary. And it will never give us what we truly desire. It will never give us true worth. It will never give us true satisfaction. It will never give us true significance. It will never give us true value. And yet we spend our whole lives focusing on improving our financial portfolio. And this, it says, is a grievous evil. Now, I've been a Christian a long time, and I've had, I've had lots of conversations about money. And what do we do as Americans when we talk about money? We quickly run to 1 Timothy 6. Oh, it's not money that's evil, it's the love of money. That's absolutely right. Here's the thing. We run so quickly to that verse, we don't see the danger of what wealth can do. We don't see the weakness of wealth and really sit in it. It is absolutely true that it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. And that's what Solomon is talking about here. That's the weakness of wealth when we fixate on it, when we try to accumulate it for its own sake, when we put our value and our worth in it. It is a dangerous thing. In fact, in Hebrews it says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For Jesus has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. All of that's true. But will we see the weakness of wealth? It will never, never, never give us what we need. What we need is true value, true significance, true worth, true wealth. And that's where the second part of the passage comes in, the power of God. The the passage that we read at the beginning, I want to read again, uh, verse 18, chapter 5. Behold, what I have seen 
To be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun. The few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. In the middle of all of this, talking about the weakness of wealth, we learn that there is a way to properly orient our hearts toward wealth and even enjoy it. But it's only by the power of God to properly orient our hearts that way. It has to be God's power. He's the only one who can change our hearts in such a way to see that wealth is something, but it's not everything. While it is correct to say that wealth is not in itself evil, that is true, it's also correct to say that in the U.S. we have made wealth an idol. And we only need to look in our recent past to see what's, what we think. The pandemic is happening, there's hot spots, the numbers are rising, and what were most conservatives, like me, saying? We need to open up now. Why? I'm not saying it was wrong to open up, by the way. Don't hear that. But we have to ask ourselves why. And I would guess that most often the reason we wanted things to open up now is because we did not want the discomfort of losing some of our wealth or any of our wealth. When we say, I hope things get back to normal, what we really usually mean is I want things to get back to my level of comfort so that I don't have to struggle. And usually it revolves around how much wealth I have left and what my life's going to be like. And when we ask, what are you worth? And we ask, what am I worth? We do have that dollar sign. And what we need is a fundamental heart transformation. And that can only happen by the power of God. That's why it says it's only by the power of God that you can enjoy these things. I know that what we want to have is a sermon that just talks about enjoying the wealth. I know that. Because that's comfortable. It doesn't poke us and prod us. But the majority of the passage is telling us, look out for an obsession with wealth. But if you want to know about wealth in God's perspective, you have to have God do a work in your heart. It has to be His power that does it. And so we have to ask the question, how, can, how does God change our hearts? How do we see the power of God at work in us? And it does begin by faith in Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, um, we have... Two letters of Paul to the Corinthians um, that are existent, that we think that there's a third and a fourth um, because of references he makes, but we know that we have two that are part of the canon of Scripture. And what we have to understand is that the Corinthian church, in large measure, was like the churches in the United States. It was filled with a mixture of people, but it was largely wealthy. And so, Paul had been collecting money for the relief work of the saints. And he had been writing to different churches, and others had gone to collect money to help. Because remember, in the, the early church, the, the large percentage of believers were poor, were brought out of slavery, or orphans that were literally cast off onto heaps to die through exposure because their parents had the right to do that in Roman law to just let their kids... It was modern-day abortion, but just... Throw them on this heap and let them die if the father didn't want them. And so Christians were known to rescue these babies and and to help the poor. And so there's relief work going on. And so Paul is chastising the wealthy church by using the example of the churches in Philippi or Macedonia. And he said, these churches are poor, and yet they're given out of their poverty to help for the relief of the saints. But you aren't even giving out of your wealth. Now it's interesting. He 
he's, he's referring to these same Philippians that he wrote, I know the secret of contentment. Whether I have plenty or I'm in want, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And he's using them as an example to say they're given out of what they don't have to help people who don't have. And you, who have a lot, aren't giving a whole lot. And then he directs them to the gospel. How could their hearts change? How could their lives change because of their heart change? He says it's by faith in Christ. He says in, in chapter two or chapter 8, verse 9 of 2 Corinthians, For you know the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you, through His poverty, might become rich. You know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you through His poverty might become rich. He's saying you know the grace of Jesus Christ. You know it. You're intimate with it. You know Him. And you know, and He's using a play on words here to drive a point home, to show what real wealth is. He says you know that He was rich. What was Jesus rich with? The riches of glory in the heavenly realms. And he became one of us. If you want a, if you want a picture of, of wealth and poverty, look at Jesus. Look what he gave up in order that through his poverty, he might allow us to be rich. Not with the wealth of this world, but the wealth of heaven. Paul is saying, God needs to do a work in your heart, rich Corinthians. You need to see wealth in the proper perspective. That anything you have on earth is a gift from God. Glory be to Him. Use it to His glory. Seek Him in it. But that's not the real wealth that believers need to focus on. The real wealth is what we have in Jesus. So the power of God begins by faith in Jesus Christ. And by His Spirit, He grows us deeper in our faith. And we see more and more that our worth is not measured in worldly wealth. And that's how God works His power to enable us to enjoy the gifts He blesses us with. I don't want you to walk away from here just saying, well, Pastor Andy's against wealth. He wants us all to become Amish and live in a community and, you know, eschew all of this other stuff. No. The Scriptures are calling us to something far deeper and far better. To see everything that we have as a gift from God. And know that it is. To seek Him in it. To seek what He wants us to do with it. We're not content to hoard. We're not content to just accumulate for our own sake. We're not content to say, well, my worth is based on my bank account. We hold these earthly treasures with open hands, knowing they came from God in the first place. Wouldn't it be great if we would ask each day, Lord, what would you have me do with what you've blessed me with? And that we find the kind of enjoyment that he longs to give us in the wealth he's blessed us with. It's only by God's power that our hearts can be redirected to properly look at wealth to be oriented toward wealth in the way that He would have us. And to the degree that our hearts are properly oriented toward wealth, we can truly enjoy what He gives us, no matter how much or how little it is. I mean, it says, <laughs> everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept His lot and rejoice in His toil... This is the gift of God. It is a gift of God to be able to enjoy the ways that He's blessed us. But if we're so focused on wealth that we can only find a discontent, then that's a problem. The passage concludes, verses 1 to 6, that without God's power 
to enjoy it, wealth is just a vapor. It's sort of a, a rehash, and for time we're not going to dig deep into it. But essentially it's saying what we've already learned. Wealth can never satisfy our souls. It doesn't have that kind of power. And it's almost like in those six verses in, in chapter 6 that, that Solomon is saying, we can give lip service that this is God's blessing to us, but if He's not given us the power, if our hearts have not been changed properly to orient our hearts toward wealth in the right way, then genuine enjoyment can never occur. Leland Riken writes, Notice where the power of enjoyment originates. It comes from God. Both having things and enjoying things are gifts from God. When the God of joy is with us, even money can prove to be a blessing. On the other hand, if God is absent, then nothing can satisfy us, least of all, money. Solomon even says, if you don't have the power to enjoy the wealth, it'd be better if you were stillborn. Strong language. So where is your heart regarding wealth? This is the time where you look down. <laughs> don't, don't make eye contact. You know, a simple way to discover where your heart is is to track how you spend money. Where is it going? Are you giving God the first fruits? like the Scriptures call us to. If not, why not? If so, why? Is it an act of joyful worship? Or do you feel like if, if I give to God, I'll get something of His blessing? Or do we give to Him because we've already gotten His blessing? What needs to change in your life's priorities? Are you resisting the Holy Spirit in His work? Have you considered that your attitude toward wealth is a gospel issue? It is an issue of faith. I think the, the last question and the most important question is, what are you worth? By faith in Christ, you are worth much more than Bill Gates. <laughs> much more than the wealthiest of the wealthy on earth, earth. Because in Christ, you have the surpassing riches of glory that He has given you. Because He became poor so that through His poverty, by faith in Him, you can become rich. And that changes how we see wealth. Father, I pray that You would drive Your Word deep into our hearts. Challenge us where we need challenge. Convict us where we need conviction. And bring us the enjoyment that can only be had by a heart that's oriented on the things that You would have us oriented upon. In Jesus' name.